For the second time in most of our lives, we shall see war. That is the war between Intel and AMD. AMD is finding itself back on top again, much in the same way it did back in the early 2000s, where certain advantages in architecture changed computing as we know it with the Athlon FX series of processors. However, it was in summer 2006 when Intel finally struck back with a devastating blow when they released the Intel Core 2 Duo. The FX60 had just come out and it was a powerhouse. It would have been the best gaming CPU you could have gotten at the time. And it didn't last long because it came out early 2006. The Core 2 Duo series, as mentioned, summer 2006, and it would take over for a while. This particular variant here, the Model E7300, was from August 2008, two years later, with an MSRP of $133. And it's something you might have had in your computer if you wanted a nice gaming system. Now this guy, it's a more mid-tier level, but its performance is still not bad, as you're gonna see. The mounting solution was the already familiar Socket 775, which had been been in use for a little while now, but obviously the chipsets would have been different. This is an Asus P5Q, and it looks like a higher end board, but I'm not sure if it is. It only has one PCI Express slot in the days where Crossfire and SLI were quite prevalent. PCI was kind of on its way out. Plenty of SATA ports, and these heat sinks, well, they're beefy. You can't help but think that this was maybe something resembling an overclocking board at the time. One thing it does share in common is the general brownish, kind of blackish, brownish. It, it, it's black, but you know, with a little bit of opaque, the gold shining through, making it seem somewhat brown. The stock heat sinks, they looked like this, and it was a very strange mounting solution because they had no, no real back plate or any real hardware on the board whatsoever. It was just this awkward situation of poking these nubbins through the hole Kind of just like that. Still don't have the hang of this actually. But yeah, press on the plungers and uh, these guys should lock into place. Key term, should. Once you've done that, we give these things a kind of turn. Oh, there you have it. Now, best I can tell looking at this board, I see the RAM traces going to the chipset. So Intel hadn't started doing the whole uh, onboard memory controller thing yet, like AMD was already doing, yet they still managed to get higher memory bandwidths. I guess they just had some rocking chipsets. This would be DDR2 spec, and the Core 2 was also one of their first 64-bit processors. So now they could run the modern operating systems that were starting to come out within the next few years. Desperate to stay relevant, AMD did about the only thing that they could do. They pushed their quad-core technology to the market well before it was ready and released the Phenom 9600. This was the one meg per core cache version. The 9500 that they released at the same time had a, uh, only 512 megs of cache. The MSRP, uh, not cheap. But this, however, is the worst processor AMD ever made. It was bad. One of the reasons why I still have it is because I have sound mind couldn't sell it to anyone. I'd have to give it away for a price that didn't even make it worth selling. So I held on to it as a kind of freak show curiosity. This thing had an architectural glitch. You had to switch off some instruction set or something in BIOS in order to have stability. It didn't overclock worth a damn and it came out at only 2.3 gigahertz. A step backwards from the 2.6 giga core that the FX60 was offering. So one might ask, just how bad was it? Using this uh, old benchmark I have, CPU Bench 2003, as a comparative single-threaded benchmark, our 9600 clocks in at 7,997 CPU marks at a RAM score of 3820 megabytes a second. Now that might not mean anything to you yet, but let's for a moment compare it to the AMD Phenom 2 X4 940, released two years later and released one year after the 9600. This is a polished version of their quad-core technology. This is the processor they intended to release. It has a score of 11,495 at 5.8 gigabytes a second. As you can see, this thing is much better, but it gets a bit worse because we did benchmark the FX60 and it gets 10,146 CPU marks. 
which is why the 9600 was such a, a brutal failure. It was worse single core than the generation it replaced. And it wasn't until the 940 that they actually caught up. And you can see the difference in scores is really only proportional to the difference in clock speed. The FX60 being 2.6 gigahertz and this guy, being 3.0. It's almost like this would use the same core architecture as the FX60, just they figured out how to stitch four of them together. I don't know. Now really, this subject's about the Core 2 Duo, so why am I talking about all these AMD processors? Perspective, because I just ran the benchmark on the Core 2 Duo, and we have 22,000. 574 CPU marks at 7.4 gigabytes a second RAM bandwidth. Now you see just how brutally devastating the Core 2 Duo release was to AMD, and they would not catch back up until recently. So uh, furthering our explorations in uh, benchmarks, comparing the Core 2 Duo against the FX60 it knocked the crown off of. In 3D Mark 03, we got 20,433 3D marks for the Core 2 Duo compared to the FX60's 18,296. Now using a slightly more updated benchmark, 3D Mark 05, the Core 2 Duo scores 12,007 3D marks compared to the FX60's 11,270. These are interesting results because as much better as this processor is, I think at this point we're seeing something resembling a GPU bottleneck as we aren't seeing huge gains in gaming output, at least not according to 3D Mark. Let's try something a little bit more practical. Now the Fear benchmark with the same video card, with the same settings dialed in, gives us a minimum FPS of 31, an average of 50, and a max of 62. FPS distribution says 15% went between 20 and 40 FPS, and 85% went above 40. Compare that to the FX60, which gave us a minimum of 31, an average of 49, and actually a slightly higher max of 64. But 23% of its performance went between 25 and 40 FPS, and only 77 went above 40. So we are also seeing slight gains in an actual game. Granted, I've always had the philosophy that even if you bought the best AMD, you, you still had a good gaming system. It looks like this thing would probably only FX60 for productivity tasks, but uh, they're kind of toe to toe for gaming. Now the question is, how's it gonna compare against the quad cores on a more modern system? So, what do we have going into this build? Well, we're talking about a 2006 architecture, but this processor that we have here is actually a 2009 release, August 2009. So we're gonna go ahead with a 2009 gaming build. Now let's assuming we're going something with an enthusiast gaming build. We just cheaped out on our CPU because we could. We're gonna max out our RAM with four sticks, a total of eight gigabytes of Kingston HyperX 1066 DDR2. This was some uh, good RAM of the time. Your average DDR2 would have been a 677 or was it a 667? You'd have at least an 800. So a 1066, that was quite the upgrade. And eight gigs then, well, that would have been equivalent to having 32 gigs now. Whereas right now you only really need 16 to build a good gaming build. Now AMD might have been down for the count for processors, but their video cards were still relevant and also released in August of 2009. If you were going to build a high-end gaming system, you might have ended up with one of these. That right there is an Asus 4870 X2. That's right, this pupper has two GPU cores on it. This was basically built on Crossfire, except if I understand correctly, unlike Crossfire, it actually worked and did give you more performance. I'm not sure if games needed to be multi-GPU coded to actually work on this thing, but that's okay because many games were. The good ones, yeah. Crossfire and SLI were taken seriously back then by developers, so if you had two cars, you were happening. Which is why we started seeing cards like this where they put two in one card. Now, no enthusiast build of the time is complete without a pair of Western Digital Velociraptors. These would have been the drives to have back then. We didn't have SSDs yet, not quite. They were coming, but we definitely had our 10,000 RPM Raptors and you had at least two of them. At least if you were me, you did. The other thing that started becoming very popular and very common back then was Steam. 
which means even though you might have still had a DVD drive in your system, it was more of an honorary position and you were starting to not use it very often anymore. For that reason, I don't have a period correct uh, case to go through this, but you know, I can use a modern one. There's a Canadian manufacturer, Turtletronics, new to the market. They have provided me their V1 case to do some build videos with. Truth be told, it's more of a budget entry level case, but it's pretty damn good looking. It's gonna serve our needs for the most part here. Here today. Now where we're going, we don't need this stupid thing because this was an era when water cooling was starting to become more popular also. Perhaps you got the first AIO ever released by Cooler Master. I had that. Or by 2008, you were quite possibly uh, building open loop with parts you bought from NCIX from uh, apparently Linus was working there at the time in charge of that department. I'm Canadian, so I definitely got water cooling parts from there. I have a period correct water block for this build. Would you look at this thing? It is frig ugly. I forget the model number, but it's made by a company called Magic Cool. And as you can see by this wear, I used an incompatible coolant back when I, you know, wasn't quite as aware. Uh, clearly there must have been some alcohol in it or something and it rotted away at some of the acrylic. Now, even though it's ugly, this thing still does work and it is actually not too bad. It's got a massive copper cold plate. It will actually yield lower idle temperatures than say something like a EK Supremacy Evo. I've compared it against one. I had this mounted on a 2700X for testing purposes at one point and it did the job just fine. Now, you look closely, you're gonna see some very coarse fins in there. So your, your max temps were going to be higher than a good block like an EK, but it still was able to do the job. Assuming you weren't doing extreme overclocking, this would cool your system actually rather well. The 65 watt TDP that we're dealing with here today isn't going to be a problem for this block. Now the rest of my water cooling components are kind of scrapped together. We're going to be using a bog standard EK2 Brez with an adjustable D5 pump. Actually the Swift Tech uh, MCP blah blah blah. The uh, actual EK pump is in my good system. And for the radiator, because that case I'm using doesn't officially support water cooling, I can't put a 240 across the top because there's not enough clearance. Uh, you can't really put one on the front because there's not enough airflow. The only place you can put a rad is a 120 on the rear. I'm going to be using this guy. That's actually scrapped off an AIO. So yes, I'm going to be mixing aluminum and copper together and using water as the coolant. But uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm not too worried about it. I'm not going to be running this system long enough for corrosion to be a problem. Obviously, don't do this if you're doing a proper build that you actually want to use. Man, this thing is light. I'm so used to copper rods. I'm sure it could do 65 watts, right? And it kind of simulates the whole AIO experience you're gonna have. They would have used an aluminum rod too. Now, to power all this, if you were an enthusiast in 2008 and you were running a card like this with an unprecedented 298 watt TDP, chances are you had something like this. That is the Antec True Power Quattro. 850 watts. That was a big deal. And this is a period correct power supply. And this was in one of my rigs for the longest time. And it still works well. I, I retired it in favor of a 1200 watt C Sonic at one point, but uh, this thing's gonna do the job nicely. Now it has the old standard form factor of an 80 mil fan at the back and unfortunately it spins a bit faster than you'd like. So this is before power supplies started getting real quiet, which ironically this thing was louder than the power supply it replaced for me, the NeoPower 480 modular. And also modular was still hit or miss back then. There were still a lot of ketchup and mustard power supplies going on. As illustrated here, this thing is clearly still ketchup and mustard spec, just black sleeved with molded bits. Like <laughs> this was this was state of the art at the time. Like you saw this and you're like, wow, that's that's pretty freaking cool. Because the power supply it replaced, even though it was also modular, still had pure ketchup and mustard. Now, some of the strange things about this guy is it is a quad power supply. It has four 12 volt rails instead of one big 12 volt rail, which uh, at the time was sold to you as a good thing, as you could isolate your loads from each other. But at the same time, it was bad if you didn't know what you were doing. Now, it's pretty hard to screw it up, but you kind of had to keep it in mind while you were building your system. 
Fully modular power supplies weren't quite a thing yet, so you would still have a bunch coming out and debatably more than you needed. We have three connectors that are rated HDD and SATA and two that are rated PCI Express. They were fully interchangeable, so if you really wanted to, you could run your SATA off the PCI Expresses so that you could isolate loads that way. I guess if you ran a lot of drives, but you're gonna notice a label. We've got V2 here, V3, and V4. Those are your different rails. So your CPU connections, like your ATX 12 volt and your main uh, motherboard connector, they were on rail one. And it sucks, because you kind of had both the four pin and an eight pin, so if you only needed one or the other, and chances are you were using the eight pin, then you'd have this stupid four pin stuck on there that you had to tuck away. Your HDD and SATA, as we know, is on V2, and V3 and V4 are PCI Express but we also have two fixed PCI Express connectors that are also V3 and V4. So you'd have to know to balance your load that way. Chances are if you had two cards and just use these ones, you'd be okay. Or if you put one card with both of these, you're gonna be okay. So like as mentioned, you know, it was a little bit tricky to be mindful of it, but it was hard to really screw up. Engaging in some of my more advanced improvised techniques and try to fit old hardware, we have the classic wing nuts tensioned on there nicely, expertly so, by myself. Remember, I've been doing this a very long time. I don't need springs. That is an EK backplate that I had from a salvage from another kit. And those are just plain bolts, but you know, that's not going anywhere. So we're off to a good start. Well, there she is, and she's uh, none too fancy. Didn't really use any pro gamer moves. Don't need them in a system this simple. You just pretty much just shuck her together. She's a bit louder than I'd like. Uh, it appears the chassis Q fan control profiles here are a little bit more aggressive. That's okay. This card is loud. And once I get this thing wound up, it's going to roar. But hey, water cooling? Uh, Hey, uh, whatever rocket scientist decided to put the power connector over here, I don't think their their mission made it, uh, you know what I'm saying? Oh, we got a PP window, which I'm wondering why they even bother doing that, because I thought part of the purpose of this was to cover that all out. Got these stickers that peeled off this cable. I've uh, gone ahead and stuck them here for good measure. Yeah, the front fans are not RGB. They are uh, PGB, purple, green, blue and they're fixed on this particular model. I don't even know how this got dirty already. It's like there's dog hair from a dog I didn't even know existed. <laughs> kind of have an allergic reaction to this panel. I'm not even allergic to dogs that I'm aware of. Let's get it put into place. These side panel holes don't quite line up 100%. Close enough though. A full acrylic side panel this thing has. Actually, you know, I will say this guy's actually really cute here. And the lighting is reminiscent of what we would have had back then. We didn't have RGB. So essentially the procedure was pick a color. And often you didn't even have LED. If you did, it was obnoxious blue ones on the fans, maybe red if you had taste. Otherwise, we actually had some CFLs. Like literal, little, little fluorescent tubes we'd mount in there. They'd be red at first, but then they'd slowly turn pink over time. That would make your build even more flamboyant than you intended. A lot of that noise is coming off the power supply. Not a lot off there. My chassis fans are ripping a bit more than normal, but that um, that video card, man, <laughs> oh, you're gonna hear it. You know, another issue you were faced up against with uh, as an enthusiast gamer of this era, your good old trusty XP you're holding out on. Oh, it was time to give up on it. You see, we had a DirectX 10 present itself to us and that meant an upgrade. That meant you were forced to transition over to Vista. Lucky for you, at this point, Vista didn't actually suck. At least not Vista 64. Vista 64 was never really that bad. You see, it was Vista 32 that was a complete fail. Especially since Microsoft was forcing all the system integrators to throw them into their little uh, big box specials that only had single core processors and 512 megs of RAM. That was not even enough resources. You needed a minimum of four gigs of RAM and some sort of multi-core processor in order to properly run Vista. Vista 32, if you know anything about 32-bit operating systems, this meant Vista 32 couldn't even support the amount of resources it needed to run. So you're SOL. However, if you had an enthusiast 
this drag with four gigs or more of RAM and a nice dual or quad core processor, well, you were pleasantly surprised when you tried Vista 64. After all, with a little bit of polish, it got rebranded to uh, Windows 7, which we all know and love, which for the purpose of demonstrations, I'm using here. Now we all like our 3D marks and one of the 3D marks of the era was 3D Mark Vantage with tests for DirectX 10 in it. So let's go ahead and run on one of these and see what this guy clocks out at. And the fans are proper ripping. I remember when I was running this video card, I could only game with headphones. There was no gaming with speakers and enjoying the experience. And heck, we're only getting 30, 40 frames a second, but then well, 3D Mark, its purpose was to tax the hardware of the time. Oh, here she comes, shiny girl. Shiny spy girl. Seriously, what do you blend in with wearing orange camouflage? Ah, yes, water snow machines. Oh, aren't you lucky you found that thing? New Calico? Oh, someone must have named it after their cat. Man, this is an era when graphics started getting really good. When games started looking the way we, we know them today. Oh, frick. That's the beast right there. With that much frickin' polluted tech covering the surface, you'd be surprised that they still have blue oceans. Oh yeah, let's blow through the asteroid field. This can make everything a lot easier. Oh, those are some devastating warheads you got there, bud. You really don't like those guys down there, do you? Oh, what are the fighter jets for? It's kind of redundant at this point, isn't it? Oh boy. Oh, is this one of the CPU tests? It must be. It's getting all these basic planes to fly around as much as possible and calculate all the AI, I guess. <laughs> this is just warming up. Obviously another CPU test. Uh, complicated operations, apparently. Oh, feature test. Ah, look at that. It's my basket weave on acid. Hey, it's RGB. And this appears that it would be some form of bu bump mapping, bump mapping or shadows. Probably shadow processing and bump mapping. Oh, look at you nice down there in your little village. Too bad you didn't piss off the calicos. Oh, wavies. Obviously, this is some sort of physics test. Oh, this is more different. It's like some sort of radar, sonar vision. Oh, peering into the nebula, I guess. All right, results are in. 3D Mark score of P10281. GPU score 15150. And a CPU score of 5234. Now, if we compare that against the Phenom X4940, Paul, oh, well, would you look at that? The X4940 clocks in at 14,158. Graphics score of 16,086. So that tells us what our GPU is doing. And a CPU score, 10,400. 13 so literally double the CPU score but of course we know that 3d mark always has a bias towards more cores and more performance so as far as 3d mark is concerned the AMD processor is superior now a game that was released the same time as this hardware that had similar computer busting qualities that crisis is known for is actually Far Cry 2 and it has a benchmark tool so how about something a little bit more practical a test to compare this Making sure we have all the same settings dialed in here. VSync DirectX 10, let's launch her. Oh my, would you look at that. I remember when I launched this game for the first time, the graphics were epic. Too bad this game was a little bit of a flop. It's probably the most hated Far Cry game. Even though when I finally did play through it, it was actually, I found it pretty good. Fire! Come my fire! Come on, come on. 
sure the battles through repetitive checkpoints were annoying, but the story turned out to be pretty good. You just had to, you know, stop the game from crashing. Eh, it happened a bit. Now this benchmark will run three passes of the same thing. It looks like something a little bit different happens each time. So let's see what we have here. Oh, we got quite the bump map going on here. At the end of the day, the average frame rate was 44.14. Max frame weight, 61. Minimum frame rate, 32. Compared to the X4940, we're seeing damn near flat 60 frame a second performance with V-Sync on, with an average frame rate of 59.52, max 62.37, and minimum of 40.28. Aha, uh -huh. the plot thickens. Now let's try it again with V-Sync off to see what happens. <laughs> Too close, bud. So what say you? Ah, similar bump maps going on here. Average frame rate, 43, max 63, min 31. Pretty much identical, since we weren't really able to break V-Sync. Whereas if we look at the X4940, with V-Sync off, we see uh, much greater variances showing what the card can actually do. Our average frame rate is 75, max goes to 104 and min at 46. Uh, clearly this rig could probably run this monitor at a refresh rate of 75, which would have been on par with a good LCD at the time. Well, this is certainly interesting. Maybe AMD wasn't that bad after all. At least if you were Team Red, you weren't doing that bad. Really, you weren't. You were able to have a good gaming experience. Now, to be fair, we're comparing apples to oranges here. We're comparing a $133 uh, mid-level Core 2 Duo to a $275 high-end quad-core from AMD, or at least their high-end. Now, with Intel, the sky's the limit. You could pay over $1,000 for one of their top-end quad cores, but they did have quad cores at the time, and you could get one at a similar MSRP. And I can only imagine with their single core IPC being double what AMD offered, if you had one of their quad cores, it was gonna be no competition. Based on these benchmarks, we are definitely seeing a CPU bottleneck. And that card is capable of doing more than what that CPU can handle. That said, it could be worth pointing out that this video card is way above that CPU's pay grade. That's a $133 CPU. That video card was easily over $800 Canadian. I know it was, it was up there when it was new. So if you could afford that video card, you'd have a way better CPU than that. And I have half a mind to go on the old Ebays and see if I can find myself a used Core 2 quad that I can slop on that pupper and see what the difference between AMD and Intel really is. If you've watched this far and would like to see that, let me know. Now, just to polish this party off, we are going to answer the question that everybody is asking right now. Can it run Crisis? 